when you look at some of the convalescent plasma that we're, we're giving to patients and some of the other treatments, what's working? Hi, good morning. Um, there's some emerging data uh, from larger and larger studies that really are showing us that the earlier we give convalescent plasma in the onset of symptoms, the better. Um, it is also showing us that uh, it does improve uh, mortality. Um, it does it like earlier in the disease better and pre-mechanical ventilation better, uh, but it still improves mortality even in those who go into mechanical ventilation. So all good news on all fronts. We just need to use it faster in the disease process. What's the vaccine pipeline looking like, Jason? How close are we to actually, you know, having something that works and that can also be distributed? Right. We have currently seven vaccines that are now in phase three, meaning safety and efficacy studies. So, um, but they are all in their infancy. Uh, they're not toddlers yet. They're, they're all beginning to enroll uh, across various uh, countries around the world. And so what we know about that is it will depend on the local prevalence in the local region about the sample size. And so we, we anticipate that they're going to enroll quickly and very quickly. Uh, but but we are still looking at a early next year at the earliest before we probably have the first uh, evidence of which vaccine might be rising to the top in terms of protections. Um, Professor Farley, there's still so much that we don't know about the vaccine. What are the most pressing things that we need to look at through studies? Right. So when we, as we roll these out into you know these phase three studies, the total number of doses that lead to produce the vast majority of people to have protective antibodies is really important. We think we know it from smaller studies, but these larger studies will first help us answer those questions. Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Uh, we, we believe it's two um, right now, and most vaccines are going out as two different vaccines. The second is um, overall safety and side effects. Anytime you go from a small number of like 25 or 50 patients into thousands and thousands, you see different side effect profiles, and we want to make sure we follow those very closely. Closely. And then finally, we want to, we, as we all always do with all vaccines, we want to follow long term to see if there are any consequences that were unexpected. How, how much of the population, do we know how much of the population actually, you know, has had COVID and developed antibodies? Yeah, so, so most of the studies, and this is one of the areas that we need greater data on, most of the studies out there on um, COVID antibody and prior infection have really been convenient samples, meaning you go, you put online, you, you show up at a store, you ask people who are there to participate. And you know, some of the things we're doing at Johns Hopkins right now is really trying to look at truly population representative samples, meaning randomly selecting households, bringing them in, trying to get away with all the noise. And so uh, we are still trying to really uncover what the truth is compared to what convenience tells us. Um, and, and expediency is what convenience gets us. It allows us to find out an answer really quickly, but they can be biased oftentimes. And so what we really need now is a better estimation of what is tr truth. Um, and we're starting those studies at Johns Hopkins uh, next week. Uh, uh, Jason, when you look at you know the, the debate about opening schools and not opening schools, I know it, it in the U.S. it has to be state by state, depending if they're you, you know the number of cases are going up or, or down. But what do we know about how difficult it is to you know stop transmission amongst kids? Yeah, I think you know the CDC just reported a, a, a youth camp uh, in which. All camp counselors and um, the children were required to be tested for coronavirus and be negative uh, uh, 12 days prior, sometime in that period prior to attending the camp. And what they've now seen is, despite the fact that they were tested and tested within 12 days, all tested negative before they arrived, within that 12 days, someone became positive and then subsequently resulted in large transmission in a seven-day camp period for children. And what that really means, and, and if we translate that into what children are seeing in their school openings, we've already had in some jurisdictions who've opened children test positive in entire classes and if not entire schools have to go on quarantine out of the school. So we're looking at a pretty chaotic 
uh, period for children who are going back into the classrooms. Uh, as, de- as people make decisions, get tested, potentially need to get retested, um, and then ultimately making decisions about whether or not to stay uh, in the class or to um, be quarantined.